We were a part of the um, clinical trials that helped lead to Truvada being approved by the FDA for PrEP use. And um, like Andrew mentioned, we're a part of the San Francisco Department of Public Health. We're an affiliate of UCSF. And we're always looking for new, innovative, and effective HIV prevention strategies. And my colleagues here will tell you a little bit more exactly how we do that. Um, so we'll hear from Dr. Hyman Scott. He's our medical director, and he leads our clinic team. He completed his medical training at Yale and UCSF. And he fights for health equity by combining biomedical and behavioral strategies and HIV prevention. And we'll also be joined by Yvette Vasquez, who's one of our clinical, um, she's one of our clinicians, and she also did the nursing program at UCSF. Um, she's currently an RN, looking forward to getting her MP license. And she's also very passionate about health equity and sexual health education. And that's reflected in her 11 years work in healthcare. So please join me in welcoming them. And I'm excited to hear about what they have to say today. Thank you, Nicole, for that great introduction. And uh, we appreciate the invitation from Andrew and the uh, city uh, CCSF for um, allowing us to participate in this uh, World AIDS Day celebration. Um, I think we always take a moment to reflect on the, uh, the pandemic that we've been fighting for over 40 years as we have been struggling with this most recent pandemic over the last two. Um, so uh, we're excited to um, do um, <clears throat> sort of a presentation in collaboration with my colleague Yvette, um, who is also on the line, um, and just talk a little bit about HIV um, prevention, some HIV basics, and um, discuss some of the counseling. We have an opportunity to, um, to uh, talk with our uh, clients and our patients around HIV and sexual health, um, and we just wanted an opportunity to share some of our approaches and then share some of our, um, our work that we're doing here. And we're uh, intentionally trying to leave as much time for questions. So if you have questions and can either pop them in the chat or hang on to them and ask them at the end, we'll be more than happy to, to answer them. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, so I'm going to skip briefly through this. Nicole sort of introduced who we are. Um, we are primarily a research organization um, in the San Francisco Department of Public Health. One of actually only two in the country where it's really tightly integrated within the health department. Um, and so we're really honored that we take that approach to the population health and our community health with all of our work. Um, we focus on our research and really started at the beginning of the pandemic. So the first study was actually looking at um, individuals who had been in a hepatitis B study in the late 70s, early 80s, just as HIV was starting to uh, become um, noticed among uh, our communities here. Um, and then going through vaccine and PrEP um, and now into as we have some interventions, including um, daily oral PrEP, looking at how do we better support people to use it and providers to, um, to prescribe. Um, and then with COVID-19, a lot of the uh, experience and research infrastructure um, really pivoted towards looking for a, a safe and effective COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and so we were very honored to participate in, um, in those studies here at uh, Bird HIV. So I'm gonna start with some HIV basics and then turn it over to Yvette to um, discuss some counseling messages. Um, and then we'll move into our, some of our work. <clears throat> So just as a, um, as a background, um, HIV um, is believed to have risen from a, um, a similar type of virus that infects uh, monkeys called simian immunodeficiency virus. Um, and it, um, it causes uh, an infection without really causing disease in the hosts uh, in which it infects. Um, and then there was close uh, contact with uh, humans um, and these primates that were infected and um, and that's how we believe HIV sort of was transmitted from primates to humans, um, probably in the 1950s, but potentially even earlier than that in the 1920s. And there's actually some potential um, cases that this may have happened as early as the late 1800s. Um, and this all occurred in um, sort of the uh, sub-Saharan Africa around the Dem uh, Democratic Republic of Congo or the DRC. There are two types of HIV, is HIV-1 and HIV-2. So for all the HIV 
testing, we often look for both of these. HIV-1 is the most common. It is the one that's um, sort of in all regions of the world. HIV-2 is mostly in West Africa, um, and it's very closely related to a specific type of SIV that's found in a, a type of monkey called a pseudomangabe. Um, and it's very similar uh, to HIV, uh, and it has some resistance to some uh, of the medications that we use for HIV-1, which is why it's something that we test for. So what is HIV? So HIV is a human, uh, human immunodeficiency virus. It's a retrovirus, so it's an RNA. Um, our genetic material is DNA, and this is the RNA. Um, and it contains some enzymes that allow it to replicate, um, and it's covered in a, in a capsid. Um, and um, this is sort of what the structure of um, HIV uh, looks like. And there's these glycoproteins around it that really help to shield it from the immune system. So it sort of helps it serve as a cloak uh, to avoid the immune system recognizing it. And um, when HIV does infect the cell, the reason I'm putting these up is because these are all targets for our uh, HIV treatment and some of our HIV prevention. So HIV has to bind to the cell. It actually has a fuse, which allows it to insert its RNA into the cell, and then that RNA gets made and uh, transcribed into DNA. And that DNA gets integrated into the genome, uh, as you can see in four. So this is why um, it's very, very difficult to cure HIV is because it is integrated into the genome. Other retroviruses do this as well. Um, and so um, after it integrates into the genome, then it uh, can start to, um, reproduce itself, and then that's how it sort of creates the copies. Um, the step three, the reverse transcriptase, is very sloppy, is sort of how we think about it. So it makes a lot of mistakes, and those mistakes, some of them are useful for the virus and develop resistance um, to some of the medications that we use. So that's how uh, resistance develops. Um, but we have targets for many of these uh, uh, points of action that allow us to uh, effectively treat HIV with our antiretrovirals. Um, when somebody is infected with HIV, and, and I'll, I'll preface this by saying this is in the absence of treatment, we're trying to give treatment to people as soon as they're diagnosed. Um, and so that avoids um, all of the complications of, um, of AIDS. And so early in infection, um, people will sometimes have acute symptoms, which uh, um, feel like a flu or cold-like symptoms. They generally last a couple of days or a week. And then they go into something called latency where they have no symptoms and they have a viral load that is um, uh, sort of stable during that time. But over time, it starts to kill more and more of the T cells which are infected by HIV. And um, at the highest point when this, the body is trying to keep up, HIV can kill up to a billion T cells a day. And so that the body's able to keep up with that for many years. But after about six to seven years, um, that's when the body starts to lose that ability to keep up with all those cells that are killed. And the viral load will um, go up, as you can see in the red, after about eight years, and then the T cell count will start to drop. And once it goes below 200 or somebody develops opportunistic infections, that's when um, you know, an AIDS diagnosis, what we are now calling advanced HIV. Um, and all that is prevented uh, with um, treatment. And what is the um, sort of primary prevention that we do um, to prevent HIV? Um, we, I sort of think about it as version 1.0 and 2.0. Um, version 1.0 is really about risk reduction counseling, testing, condoms, uh, group and individual level uh, interventions and needle exchanges. And um, version 2.0 is about combining these um, and using treatment as prevention, pre-exposure prophylaxis, um, continuing needle exchange. We're hopeful, and you'll hear some of this from um, Yvette, that we're looking for version 3.0. So um, those involve new uh, options for prevention. Underlying all of this are sexual health discussions and how do we talk to people in a uh, health promoting way about sex. Um, and um, I am going to um, just give a brief update on PrEP, and then I'm going to pass it off to Yvette to talk about the um, sexual health discussions. Just so everyone is on the same page, what PrEP is, um, it is not post-exposure prophylaxis. This is pre-exposure prophylaxis, um, a prevention strategy for people who are HIV negative. There are two options, uh, Truvada, which is tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate or TDF, 
and intracytabine, um, and that was approved in 2012. And there's a newer formulation, uh, tenofovir alafenamide and intracytabine, which is TAF FTC, which is approved in 2019. It's one pill taken daily, um, regardless of plans for sex. For Truvada, there's actually, um, we can use it on demand for people who are having rectal sex, mostly MSM is a group that's been studied and it's really, really, really effective. So 99% in per preventing HIV um, as prescribed. So I'm gonna now pass it off to Yvette to talk a little bit about um, talking about sex. Thank you, and thank you everybody for having us. Um, I just wanted, again, to introduce myself, uh, one of the registered nurses here, and you know the visits that we do at Bridge can take anywhere from 15 minutes as a treatment visit up to two and a half hours. And we can be with these participants from like for a short period of time or for, for years. So we, uh, that's kind of gives a little bit of the context when we're talking to folks around sex, we're trying to build a relationship and a rapport. So when I introduce myself, I uh, give a background of where I've done uh, work in the past with City Clinic, Strut, um, and I was also a communicable disease investigator that talked a lot about chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, and HIV. So I try to preface that when I check in with my participants so that they feel comfortable with me and know what my experience is. I'm really big about sex positivity and safety. Uh, being that we are a research site, sometimes people can uh, be a little weary around safety and these are, um, we're doing research on these experimental vaccines. So I consistently repeat that during my conversations when I'm talking to folks around um, HIV and STI prevention. So another piece that is big for me is language. Um, when you're talking to folks, some people may use different language, for example, front hole versus vaginal hole. Um, with uh, some sex work, some people like to call it sexual services or servicios sexuales. All these uh, terms and words um, matter uh, to me when my participants or my clients are using them and I reflect those words back. Uh, and this is evolving, something that we may think is okay now may not be okay you know, in a few years. So that's one thing that I really do appreciate um, when I'm talking to folks is I'm also learning from my patients and participants. Um, and again, that goes into knowing your, popu your population. When you're talking to folks, you, know, you have to know what their experiences are, be sensitive to what their history looks like because it is a sensitive topic for um, many people. They might not have, they might be the first time they're having a conversation with providers or feel comfortable with counselors um, and it could be triggering because we do get into post-exposure prophylaxis and uh, sometimes there can be non-consensual uh, consensual sex that occurs. So you have to kind of make sure to be sensitive to all backgrounds and uh, situations. And I think another piece that's important is explain why you're asking um, what kind of sex you're having, what kind of um, body parts do you use uh, during sex so that we can assess you know, what kind of healthcare we wanna provide. Uh, so I'm big on, you know, informing and empowering folks. And next slide, please. So once we get like after that kind of discussion um, around the overview of what they're, um, what kind of services we're providing to folks, I start off with the visit and kind of get into the less sensitive questions and material. So I'll do the medical and social history, then get into the more mental and sexual health related items, um, because we do have to check in around uh, folks' um, chronic conditions and make sure everything, everybody's stable and able to uh, understand what they're getting into, uh, because again, it's a research study. Um, another piece that's really big, I'm sure you all know, is open-ended questions take a lot of practice. Um, I think that when you do your work with folks, it, it's really important to try to continue to ask open-ended questions like, what type of sex are you having? Um, uh, that's one of them I ask, and then I check in, um, and I pr probe a little bit more if they don't want to answer the question. I think another thing for me that's big is asking what kind of signs or symptoms people are looking for when it comes to sexual 
health because some folks may not know what to look for, for example, with syphilis. So, you know, I'll, I'll ask specifically and kind of assess people's knowledge um, and use that as a starting point and a, a conversation starter to check in to see what, um, you know, what their knowledge is. Next slide. Uh, this um, information, sexual uh, history discussion, comes from the CDC. Uh, these are kind of the ideal points that you want to um, hit when you're talking to folks around sex. And there's a more extensive uh, piece, if you could see the link on the bottom, with uh, CDC treatments and discussions. So you want to check in about what kind of partners um, they're having sex with, uh, if it's, if, you know, if it's men, trans women, um, cis women, all that matters because you wanna assess what kind of care that you're gonna be providing. And then with those discussions, you talk about like what kind of sexual practices they're having and then offer, you know, if somebody's not using condoms, I'm not gonna offer condoms, but I, you know, we'll check in about lube and check in about if they're discussing um, STI statuses with folks, uh, things of that nature. And then um, past history of STIs is also important to kind of inform what their experience and what their knowledge is. Uh, I think for studies as well, pregnancy and tension is also something that we need to check into because we're using um, experimental products as well. So it's important on our end. Next slide. Uh, this is just a quick example around language uh, matters and trying to take the word risk out of the conversation. Sometimes when we're talking amongst each other, we'll say, you know, to reduce risks uh, for participants. But here you can see on the left, it says PrEP is a tool that can be used to reduce anxiety about HIV and take control of your sexual health, as opposed to saying PrEP is for people at high risk for HIV who want to decrease their risk of becoming infected. It just has more of a proactive approach with taking control and it like kind of addresses some of the mental health around it. Um, so that's one piece that we try to do is take out the stigma and the shaming around sex. Next slide. Uh, so this just demonstrates again, how we have various tools with HIV vaccines that we're trying to develop. We have condoms, we have PrEP, on-demand PrEP and STI testing but we still, like the ones that are broken off are some of them that we're working on and we still haven't been able to complete this puzzle. There's you know, HIV vaccines that we're working on, um, PrEP implants, and we'll talk more in detail about each of these pieces that we're trying to add to our toolbox. Next slide. Uh, this, one, this slide is addressing um, the decline of testing that has occurred and how the, um, pandemic has affected uh, testing and people's ability to go in. So if you look at the left, that one uh, is medical facilities. And if you look at the red highlighted area, you see in both the left and the right, because the right one is for community sites and the left one is for medical facilities. Both of them have a sharp decline in the time of March, 2020 to about May, June, 2020. And we are seeing you know, the rise come up in medical facilities, but you can see that it's still kind of, it's still low on the right-hand side with the community sites. So testing, which was a huge tool, um, is obviously like we're declining in that uh, tool. So we need to continue to work on um, other measures. Next slide. So Hyman, um, I think right here, this is your... Yeah, so um, we wanted to um, take a, a shift towards talking about some of the work that we're doing um, to try to get to this, uh, completing this mosaic and getting to hopefully HIV prevention 3.0. Um, and so there's a few ways that we have sort of approached this here. Uh, one is supporting um, PrEP use and adherence. So um, taking a pill either once a day or on demand um, does require at least a daily or an, uh, more frequent decision about um, how you take it or if you take it. And so helping people with that, we're gonna talk about some of our tech um, approaches for uh, trying to help people. And then there are new forms of PrEP that sort of remove the 
necessity for making a daily or a more frequent decision about whether to take PrEP. So there's an injectable cabotegavir um, that is, uh, we'll talk about, there's two other new medications, lenacapavir and slatrovir, um, which all have very interesting uh, HIV retroviral names. Um, and we'll go through a little bit of our work um, um, for those. So um, starting with the PrEP support, um, and Dr. Liu is also uh, here in the Zoom audience. Um, and so this is uh, a project that focused on called PrepMate, which um, was a two-way texting tool that um, was developed by uh, Dr. Liu and his colleagues um, to support PrEP uh, adherence and persistence. So people starting PrEP uh, and staying on PrEP. It was actually the first um, CDC adopted evidence-based intervention for PrEP to support people like, for continued use um, and showed great um, results in a, a trial that was done with a, a, a group of young people in Chicago. Um, and so this is an example of one of the projects that um, involves sort of two-way texting and there's automated texts that go out to uh, give support, some cool facts. Um, and then if somebody responds to the text message um, with either a question or something going on in their life, it would sort of triage that to um, have a staff member talk to them um, and then sending them uh, reminders about taking their pills. Um, this is another um, uh, sort of mobile M Health um, project that was focused on um, tracking and supporting protection levels. So we know that um, daily, so daily prep has some forgiveness. Um, and so giving feedback to individuals as they're taking their pills about how they're doing and what we uh, would anticipate their level of protection to support um, adherence would be. So this was called Dot Diary. It included a um, sort of uh, AI, artificial intelligence uh, um, observation of people taking their pills and then calculated what their uh, protection level would be based on the number of pills that they took and also uh, based on when they would have sex. And so um, if sex was uh, protected, um, it was in green with high protection, yellow with medium, and then with uh, low or no protection, it was in, in red. And um, another uh, tech-based um, intervention to really help people uh, with their PrEP adherence is a um, collaboration. This is with Dr. Bookbinder leads this project with Alto Pharmacy, which some of you may use. Um, they're a local um, pharmacy, a specialty pharmacy in San Francisco. Um, and this is actually a pharmacy-led um, PrEP delivery. So they actually have vans that go out and deliver medications to people's homes. Um, and so reducing the um, burden on the healthcare setting, uh, the pharmacists uh, manage the PrEP under a collaborative practice agreement with the physicians um, and they prescribe PrEP, they order and track labs um, and they, um, they support the adherence with um, the online tools um, and the pharmacy based um, support tools. So this is an ongoing study um, that we're doing as well that sort of supports this uh, focus on helping people start PrEP and to stay on PrEP, to stay protected. And so, um, and so these are all sort of focused on PrEP. And then um, as we think about what are other options uh, using the model of birth control, where it's not just oral contraceptives, that people have rings, they have injectables, they have implants. Um, so trying to get to a, a state where people have choice um, so they can choose what works best for them for now. Um, and if something works better for them later, um, making a different choice. Um, and so uh, Yvette is gonna talk a little bit about our um, studies that we're doing that are looking at um, new options for PrEP. Yeah, this is some of the exciting work that really, I uh, just jumped on around uh, the time with COVID with our COVID vaccine, and it's really opened our doors to a lot of different studies and a lot of new avenues. So, um, but we're gonna focus mostly on um, the other forms of PrEP which you see here is an injectable cabotegravir that's a bi-monthly PrEP injectable. So our participants come in uh, within a window period, bi-monthly, receive one injection, and it's a really promising, exciting piece of uh, research and uh, product that's coming down the lines that, that I'm sure you all would hear, will hear more about in the public. 
And the other study in power uh, 024 is a new monthly PrEP pill. So this is another form, instead of taking it on a daily basis, we're studying a PrEP pill in comparison and the comparator is Truvada or Descobi. And another exciting piece is the Purpose 2, which is a semi-annual injectable uh, PrEP medication that we are using for transgender women. Uh, at this site, the other sites are also uh, working with other study participants. And the other uh, studies that you can see here, because COVID opened up our door with, uh, I mean, sorry, COVID opened up the door to work on um, AstraZeneca, which is another the vaccine. We also have opened the door to doing a herpes uh, outbreak study, um, study around gonorrhea. And is, uh, just for time's sake, I'm not gonna go through every single one, but we do have a lot of exciting uh, studies on the horizon. Next slide, him. So here's some like advantages and disadvantages around long acting injectable um, HIV prevention. The one specifically that we're actively doing is cabotegravir. So, you know, it doesn't, we're getting folks in bi-monthly injecting uh, and the visit takes about maybe 30, 45 minutes and um, you don't have to take a pill every day. So that's a piece that's huge because what we hear often is that there's you know pill fatigue and adherence as an issue, which lowers the efficacy of Truvada or Descovy. So this um, medication um, is showing to be uh, superior to those medications because of uh, the reason that you just have to do it bi-monthly. But the disadvantages can be that it, um, once you put the medication into your system, it's uh, unable to be removed if toxicity occurs. So um, there, and there is a long, uh, what we call pharmacologic tail. So it lasts in the body for a, for a long period of, a longer period of time than Truvada or Descovy. Um, and there is a adherence for these injections. So some folks that maybe have uh, phobias to needles, for example, you know, may not be very excited to come in on a bi-monthly basis to get this medication. Um, so it just has more complications when you start and stop this medication. Uh, so this is uh, some, again, I had mentioned cabotegravir. It's been in the study found to be statistically superior to daily uh, PrEP and a lot of our um, participants are loving the, the option. Uh, around this, it's a long acting injectable HIV integrase inhibitor. Uh, so Hyman earlier mentioned that there's different stages um, to the process of HIV infection. And this one is, this medication blocks the insertion of HIV DNA into the CD4 cell. Um, and it's, there's two different studies going on. We're doing the portion of the HIV prevention study. And there is also a parallel study that is done and they're using this medication for treatment as well. Okay, and this is uh, this purpose to study is also um, sorry, so, uh, the medication is a long acting injectable pre um, HIV integrase inhibitor, and it also is going to be something that we're doing for HIV prevention, but not for treatment. Uh, this study currently we're still working on getting this going. We're going to be doing the study for purpose uh, two for cisgender men and transgender individuals. And then this is the other uh, medication that I was discussing with a monthly oral pill. This Latrevere is another new form of uh, PrEP that we're setting. And we're uh, doing this for, again, just the HIV prevention portion. We're not doing the treatment uh, for cisgender men and transgender women who have sex with men. Um, and that's it for that. So that's our piece. Uh, I know that we kind of went through this quickly uh, for sake of time and wanting to answer any questions from folks. I have a question. Um, just for clarification, bi-monthly can mean both twice a month or every two months. So I'm wondering what what this one is. Is it every two weeks or every two months? Every two months. Oh, Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. Okay, great.
And just a comment about uh, the cabotegravir. So that study um, has shown that it, it worked actually better than Truvada, which has been shown to work really, really, really well for HIV prevention. So we were really excited um, by that news. We anticipate that it might be available as early as uh, January of 2020 for prevention. It's already approved in combination with another medication for HIV treatment. Um, and so um, it is something that we anticipate will be um, available in our communities very soon. And I also like to point to the graphic for the questions. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but that shot is given in one of your butt cheeks. That is correct. <laughs> so I see some questions in the chat. Um, so um, it looks like, can you speak to the process of notifying people who could have been infected by their partner? Um, Yvette, do you wanna take that question? Yeah, uh, so the Department of Public Health has a couple of teams um, that work uh, on doing partner notification that is, uh, you know, legally we have to keep it anonymous. Uh, but when we get reports of people who are positive for gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, HIV, um, we uh, have to have this very sensitive conversation around who their partners are and what information they're willing to provide around um, just to help lower or slow the, the spread of these infections. And we, we would then at that point get whatever information that we possibly can for of these folks and we kindly call them and state, hi, I'm calling from the Department of Public Health. Uh, somebody was you know, kind enough to uh, notify you that they, you've been in contact with, you know, gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, and um, we're calling to invite you in for treatment and just to educate you more about what um, this infection entails. So that's one of the jobs that I did at, uh, with Department of Public Health as a communicable disease investigator. And um, if they don't feel comfortable giving this information to us, uh, because, you know, of course, privacy or uh, some folks and do it themselves, uh, will notify their partners themselves. We respect that. Uh, but we, um, there's also an app that people have anonymously, you know, it's an app that anonymously notifies you that you've been in contact with a certain infection. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, and um, when the health department notifies, so if there is, um, you know, early syphilis or HIV, um, you know, we really try to support people coming in to get tested and then offer them post-exposure prophylaxis for HIV if it has been, uh, you know, within 72 hours. Um, and, um, and then for the STIs like uh, syphilis, chlamydia, or gonorrhea, we will treat people after an exposure, um, even if their tests are negative. So. And it's all done anonymously. There are no names that are disclosed um, and it's all part of our public health um, approach. Um, so there's, looks like a question for me about virus transcribes into the genome via RNA. Um, so is that the reason why mothers do not transmit to their, ch to their child? Um, so the, the genome is of, um, of HIV is RNA and then is transcribed into DNA and then it integrates into the uh, human genome. So if a mother has HIV, that has sort of occurred um, and it's sort of integrated into the cells. Um, there are mother to child transmissions that do occur. Um, they, they haven't occurred in San Francisco in about 15, almost 20 years because of our public health efforts to prevent it. So we have been really trying to work to get to zero. We have gotten to zero from other child transmission. Um, we know that the treatments work um, and then we start treatment early and we uh, support treatment through the pregnancy and offer the, um, the child post-exposure prophylaxis if it's indicated. Um, but there are mother to child transmissions that occur 
globally that are still happening. Um, and so that is one of the, the routes for HIV transmission. Um, and so um, that is really around um, treatment as prevention. So treating the mom is good for the mom and also good for the baby. Um, and then there's a question about the matter of genes. Is there an effect um, to telomeres with the medications? Um, I don't, I'm not aware of any uh, specific effects of telomeres. Uh, telomeres are at the ends of the genomes and um, have been associated with a variety of things, including sort of aging. Um, but we haven't, I don't, I'm not aware of any um, impact of um, either HIV on, specifically on telomeres or the treatment um, changing telomeres. But those are all excellent questions. Um, so there's a question about um, what we might be planning to do to increase the testing level that you noted has decreased significantly. Uh, Yvette, do you want to take that one or you want me to, to field it? Um, I mean, right now, because I'm not in tune with what's going on at City Clinic, I, that was a previous uh, job. I know that they work really hard and have, like, prior to the pandemic, they were working on getting to zero uh, infections. So they have still a task force and a team that um, does a lot of, uh, you know, community work and go into the communities. I know that that had stopped for a little while and they were redirected for COVID efforts. And I believe now that, you know, things are changing a bit. I'm sure that they're changing their efforts back to trying to um, go in, back into this uh, goal of getting to zero. I'm not sure if you want to add to that, Hyman. Yeah, so um, we have seen a rebound. Um, during COVID, we actually did a lot of education with um, providers and with uh, patients as, and clients as well around um, what is considered an essential service. So for a while, only essential services were allowable during the um, sort of shutdowns and we, made a, an argument, we made a um, pitch and argument that was adopted that HIV prevention and care services are essential and that they should be allowed to be continued. Um, and then um, really trying to educate the community that um, you know going into a health facility to get testing is a safe thing to do um, during COVID given all the precautions. Um, and then um, supporting clinics and other sites that were doing testing to sort of continue to, um, to revamp and ramp up. So we have seen that happen in the community, um, in the medical facilities. We haven't seen the same level of rise in the community um, testing sites, which are actually, um, in terms of volume, the largest place where we do testing in the city. And so there's an ongoing effort to support community-based organizations, community health workers, um, HIV test counselors. For uh, over a year, probably close to a year and a half, there was no uh, HIV test counselor training um, that was occurring. There's a lot of people who left the city um, and I'm sure you've all experienced that. So there's a lot of reasons that um, I think it's been more difficult to, to get testing back up in the community settings, but we wanna support community-based organizations, which are a foundation of our HIV prevention and treatment response in the city uh, to sort of support more HIV um, testing. Oh, and then I'll um, put a link in the chat about the Have Good Sex campaign. So this is one of the campaigns um, focused on helping people do testing for HIV and STIs through um, home test kits. I really encourage you to take a look at it. It's got some really good sex positive imagery with uh, fruits and foods um, that are artfully placed and decorated. So um, it is actually a quite fun campaign if you want to take a look. It's called havegoodsex.org. All right, another question is prep free for those that qualify and who do patients contact if they do not have insurance? Um, as for testing, who are the primary focus for the county? Uh, Yvette, do you want to take either of those? Uh, yeah, I think um, those that, so it's free for those that qualify using, there's a program called Advance, uh, Advancing Access. Um, the, the clinics, or a lot of community clinics have um, 
what they call navigators on site that help folks based off of, you know, their, uh, they get some information and they see what programs they qualify. Gilead also has a program uh, that assists, assists them with some of the medications, um, especially if you're, if you have a PEP situation, a post-exposure uh, prophylaxis situation within 72 hours and it's, they need uh, emergency medications. Um, there are programs that assist folks who are not insured or if the copay is too high, uh, they help assist with some of those costs. Um, in terms of testing, we, again, generally, uh, Department of Public Health tries to work with community-based clinics uh, to do outreach to folks, um, MSM community, transient community, uh, folks that, um, I mean, those are the primary uh, folks that I would say, I don't know if I'm missing any, Hyman, um, that I know, for example, City Clinic and Strut focus on targeting. Yeah, those are the, the communities. What we've seen is we really try to use the data from our EPI report every year to see where our gaps are. Um, and we've seen um, the disparities increase in certain communities. So among um, Latinx individuals, um, among people who inject drugs and among um, women, we've seen sort of uh, HIV and infections going in the wrong direction. So those are really the communities and people experiencing homelessness. So those are the, um, those are the communities, those are the groups of folks that we're targeting for our effort. Um, and that's in addition to what we're already doing. We don't wanna lose the ground that we've already gained with the communities we've engaged with for our testing, but we wanna sort of expand our, um, our testing so that we can um, support um, preventing these disparities from worsening and hopefully um, completely eliminate them. And um, to the question about PrEP, yeah, it's free for anyone who qualifies. There's a variety of programs that people can qualify for um, if they don't have insurance. And PrEP is now with uh, Tenofovir for TDF FTC is now generic. Um, and so most uh, pharmacies will um, offer it at about $30 to $40 a month. So um, on patent, which was before it went generic, it was about $1,800, 15 to $1,800 a month, which is unaffordable for the vast majority of people. Um, but now it's $30 um, a month for 30 pills. So that doesn't include the cost of uh, seeing a provider and getting labs done, but there is a California um, sort of prep assistance program, which helps cover the cost for people who have income qualifications for that. So there's a, uh, there's a variety of things. It's not like many of our goals, which have a universal healthcare system that supports the full cost of preventative and, um, and sort of disease specific care. But we do have a lot of resources in um, San Francisco and many of the prep clinics do support um, navigation services to help people navigate the financial parts of um, starting and then also getting them into um, to clinics uh, if they if they need to for primary care. And Nicole put in a link for the advancing access to Gilead, which is a great resource. Um, there's a question about Planned Parenthood's uh, clinics. Still, yes, they still exist um, uh, in California. I should say they still exist in California. I think that there are a lot of states that are really um, uh, attacking the existence of uh, clinics like Planned Parenthood. Uh, thankfully, California is not one of them. And yes, you can get PrEP from there. Um, they do offer PrEP uh, at the Planned Parenthood clinics um, in all over the Bay Area. Um, and there's a question about, uh, do we see a rise, uh, do we see a HIV rise in, in youth? Um, <clears throat> we haven't really seen that locally or actually uh, nationally. The um, youth are definitely disproportionately impacted by HIV based on their population size, but the largest number of um, infections actually occur in around the um, 30 year olds, so uh, late 20s to early 40s, like that's actually the age group where we're seeing um, sort of the increase in HIV infections. All the other age groups are flat or, or declining, but that's actually a rising a group. So we, um, we do wanna not forget about young people um, and the unique risk um, that they might have and unique challenges they might have. For example, being on their parents' 
um, health insurance, limiting their access to PrEP because they're technically insured, but their parents might know that they're gay, but they might, or, uh, or trans, but might not know that they're having sex. Um, and so getting a, um, an insurance uh, explanation of benefits that says Truvada on it. Um, and there are now commercials for Discovy and having uh, that discussion with parents has been a barrier for some uh, young people who might not be out um, to their parents about everything. All right, so there is another question. Um, so the clients who have main concern is uh, STIs will be HIV. Um, shout out to that for framing the advice on PrEP as a tool that's not talking about risk. Um, emphasizing that these medications do not prevent other STIs. Um, so that the question is, uh, what are your thoughts and best practice recommendations um, on this and how would you best advise clients about um, the role of PrEP and other STIs? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we didn't address that much. I, I think, again, it's depending on the conversation that folks have or like the what tools they use. So if folks do use Condoms, for example, like I, I tell folks, you know, when you're leaving the house, you say keys, wallet, phone, condom, and a little lube, um, just because you don't know when or what kind of situation and, um, you know, happy hour can turn into meeting somebody, for example. Th those are just kind of little fun tidbits that I kind of talk to folks about, depending on if they use condoms or not. If they don't use condoms, again, like with application or apps, you can put in there, like, you know, when you last got tested or, kind of have that conversation with folks prior to meeting them uh, at like at you know your place or their place and it kind of helps the more you talk about you know and check in with folks um, when you can obviously when things are heavy you can't do that but I say the the more you advise your patients and participants and check in about how they talk about it kind of get more details uh, around how they're doing it currently and if they even are some folks, you know, when they're, when they're on prep, they, the, what I've noticed or heard from some folks, not all is that they, you know, those conversations are few and far in between, except with repeat partners. So that's what I also tell folks is to check in with, you know, your repeat partners um, around STIs and um, have that conversation of informing each other when you do um, test positive. So it can, you know, help with, uh, you know, going and getting prophylactically treated or treated as a contact. Um, I think those are some of the tools that I use. I don't know if Hyman, um, Al, or Nicole, you all have used other best practices. Um, STI testing uh, at least every three months because syphilis, for example, has a really large window period. Anywhere um, up to three months is what we can see um, an incubation period of it growing in the blood. It's another thing I tell folks. And, um, you know, with, I try to remind folks that, you know, with herpes and uh, condoms are also a good tool, but um, they, you know, PrEP is also a good tool. You can continue to use these as much as you can. And if you don't use them all the time, that's also okay. Um, do what, you know, what's most comfortable for the patient and the participant. Yeah, I, I totally agree with all those points. And I also wanted to, um, so my approach is I, I educate my uh, clients or patients that, you know, this is an HIV prevention tool. Um, it's not an STI prevention tool. We do need more STI prevention tools. I also will point out, and I, I like to, to mention this because I don't think it gets talked about enough, is that risk reduction counseling for STIs does not work. It does not work. There are lots of studies that have shown it in, um, in sort of observational where they looked at what happened to people for HIV uninfected individuals. And there was a randomized control trial that looked at really structured counseling for STI prevention versus just telling people about STIs and bringing them in for testing. And there was no difference. And that giving counseling actually didn't uh, reduce STIs. But for men with sex with men, there were more STIs among those who got counseling than those who did not. So for some communities, actually, it's harmful. And so um, it's a reflection, I think, of the reasons why people have sex. Like, it's not 
risk driven. It's really about pleasure and talking to them about what it is that they're doing. And, and, um, and I think PrEP has changed our framework about talking about HIV. And what we really need are options for preventing STIs. So if somebody has had multiple STIs like syphilis, for example, I do offer them doxycycline as an option for STI prevention. Um, we have some uh, early data that that's actually an effective tool for syphilis and chlamydia, not so much for gonorrhea, um, but really talking to people about what all their options are and giving them um, advice about ways um, to, um, to stay, uh, to have healthy, fulfilling um, sex lives. And that um, risk reduction counseling is not something, which is why it's not what we focused on, um, because it really, it just, it doesn't work. Um, and we know that the fear attack, the, the sort of using um, concerns about uh, risk and fear um, don't really um, result in our ultimate outcomes, which is uh, health promotion. And I'm happy to share the, um, the references to the, um, the counseling data, because I do think it is um, a paradigm, a different paradigm than I think most people are trained in. And it, um, and it, it's been difficult to, um, for many uh, groups, um, particularly health groups, to really um, uh, embrace that the counseling um, and risk reduction counseling is, is just not effective. Um, there's a question about the Office of Family Planning covering birth control. Um, I don't know if they cover PrEP as well. I don't know if anyone else on the Yvette or Al or Nicole, I'm, I'm not aware if they cover PrEP. Um, another shout out to Yvette about the way she uh, framed the rapport building and meetings. Thanks, Nicole, for putting in the please prep me. Um, there's a question about, uh, do we have a, a rise of HIV positive people in the immigrant communities? Um, I think we have, we have definitely seen a, um, a disproportionate rise in the absolute number of uh, individuals uh, who identify as Latinx um, diagnosed with HIV. We don't <clears throat> know um, all the details about immigrant status and, um, uh, and so that's something that we can definitely look into and see, I can, we can look at our uh, available public health data um, to see if that um, is among individuals who have recently immigrated or um, not recently immigrated or first or second generation um, in, in our San Francisco community. That's a great question. Um, there's a question about uh, numbers on HIV in the deaf community. Um, we don't have any population health numbers um, about uh, individuals who are um, deaf and uh, newly diagnosed with HIV or living with HIV um, in, um, in San Francisco. But that is something that I can ask our uh, epidemiologists if that data are collected. Um, because for all the cases in San Francisco, there are chart reviews that are done. Um, and so if that's documented, the team would have access to it. I just don't know if it's collected routinely. Right, there's a, this is great. Thank you for all these wonderful questions. I am mindful of time. So uh, I'll, I'll kick it back to Nicole and Andrew about um, going forward or how, Looks like there's a two more questions. Oh yeah, we can go till 6.10. Oh, okay, great. <clears throat> um, so there's another question. Um, it's part of our uh, research on effectiveness of new drugs. Um, what ways do we outreach to diverse communities, immigrants, other people of color to ensure that the subjects reflect the diversity of our community? Um, maybe I'll ask uh, Nicole. Yes. I think that's a great question. Um, I think first, our staff actually reflects a lot of the communities that we outreach to from leadership to our frontline staff, so folks who are working directly with patients. And that's a huge part of um, kind of 
getting our community involved. And as you can hear, a lot of us do really care about health, health equity and that comes into the work that we do. And Bridge HIV is really focused on health equity and how our study demographics are made up. So we make a point to have internal demographics where we want representation um, a 50% of our studies are made up of um, Black or Latin folks, so that's something that we focus on. Uh, in terms of outreach, again, a lot of the people who work here are part of the communities we're trying to reach, and so um, we have trans women on. We have a trans woman on our staff, and she is very open about, hey, th this is a group that we need to reach out to. And so we help build community in these groups instead of having a transactional relationship. We're really focused on having transformative relationships with the groups that we outreach to. Um, so we don't want to say, hey, we need you for this study. Um, and then we no longer want to work with the community. So we're really active in building community and staying with community um, and building a rapport and a partnerships so across different demographics. Graphics. Um, and that may come in the way of sponsorship if we're sponsoring an event. So understanding the resources we have that we can provide communities in that way. Um, community education is a huge part of what we do as well. So making sure all of the groups are aware of the studies and the resources that um, we're um, providing and how they are represented. So everyone's aware of um, the different uh, gaps or disparities in ways that we're working to close that and inviting people to participate in the study um, design as well. So we have a group called a community advisory group and it's made up of different members of the community. And what our directors and principal investigators do is they bring the material or the studies um, whether it's recruitment materials or grants or different ideas that we would like to participate in, we bring it to this group and we get their direct feedback. Um, so things that the participants will see, our community members are able to give us direct feedback on our language, our graphics, if something is missing, if something should be said differently. Um, and so we're always inviting people who are a part of the community to be in this group. Um, and we meet every month. Um, on Tuesdays, if you all are interested, we're definitely looking for more folks to be a part of our community advisory group to give direct input in the studies that we choose to participate in and how we participate in these studies. Thank you, Nicole. Um, I am trying to see, so what lessons about public health and prevention of HIV do you, do you think can help with COVID? Um, I actually think that our response to uh, COVID in San Francisco was really buttressed and supported by our response to HIV. I think that there was a community public health partnership that had already existed, that there had been the, the growing pains and the, the learning to work together that um, was sort of done during the HIV um, pandemic. Um, I think that there was a, um, a trust of the public health infrastructure and a support of it. Um, so when public health messaging came out that was, um, you know, everyone stay home and wear a mask, that there was general um, acceptance of the importance of that, that we would not be saying that unless we really felt like it was the um, best option to keep people safe. Um, and so I think that um, a lot of the testing, a lot of the communication and education um, and um, the, the presence of a lot of public health um, uh, individuals and our, um, our large and well-supported infrastructure for epidemiology and for um, disease investigation really formed the foundation for um, our response to COVID. So I think we had a, um, a head start towards um, responding to COVID. We were, you know, the first jurisdiction to really shut things down. Um, and I think that that was because um, our political leadership trusted our public health leadership um, because of HIV. And I think that what we can learn is that, um, that that coordinated effort with COVID hopefully can back translate into additional support for HIV. I am still, 
we know every day the number of COVID tests that happen and who's positive. And it takes, you know, months and for CDC years for us to get that data. And we should learn a lesson that we can do that. We can get more granular data faster if we set up infrastructures to support it. So I think we can also learn a lot from COVID um, that can support our HIV prevention and um, work. So there's a, a HIV, a way to get involved. The HIV Planning Council is looking for new members. Um, the application link is in the chat. Um, I put in a link to the article I referenced on uh, the effect of risk reduction counseling on uh, STIs. It was published in JAMA, which is one of the premier uh, medical journals. Uh, Nicole, uh, posted a link for her email if somebody's interested in the CAG. And we have a World AIDS Day. Love all these links. It was a World AIDS Day getting a zero event tomorrow. And um, at that event, um, we're also gonna be talking about the impact of um, overdoses in our communities. Great. Well, we're just about at time. Uh, I'll kick it back to uh, Andrew and Nicole. This is really, really wonderful and uh, appreciate everyone's attention and engagement with all these amazing questions. So really honored to, to be able to, to present today. Yeah, thank you so much. Oh. Hey, uh I also just wanted to echo that. Thank you, um, Hyman and Nicole had invited me to speak. And again, education, I was a teacher prior to becoming a uh, part of the uh, healthcare system. So I always appreciate the opportunity and I wish we could be more interactive and uh, present, uh, but thanks everybody for your time. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Daruni, do you have any uh, words you'd like to share here? Uh, as part of, many of us here are part of the community health worker um, principles and practice one class. So uh, I didn't even introduce Daruni and Terry, uh -huh. who were uh, the primary uh, instructors of that class. Um, well, I just wanna say thank you so much for coming. I, I think I've been to almost every presentation in the last four or five years that you've presented and I've learned something new every single year. Um, I've started my public health work doing HIV work and there's so much still to be learned um, on it. So um, I always appreciate um, the opportunity to hear the innovative side of public health and to see the possibility um, in this work in terms of four CHWs, like from, you know, um, outreach to doing, you know, um, being a test counselor, to being in research, to doing policy. So, um, and, and just the, this session of how all the different aspects of it um, was very informative. So thank you very much for taking your time and just, and everyone for attending.